Bruce Michael Dietzen, maker of the Renew Sports Car. It is so wonderful to have you on the show today. Joy, it's a pleasure to be, be with you, my friend. I got to spend some time with you at uh, NOCO 7, the Northern Colorado Hemp Expo, uh, at which time you brought, as you have traveled around the country with it before, your latest and greatest hemp Renew sports car. Now, I know that you came to the hemp movement. You are an environmentalist of fairly epic proportions. Um, and you came to the hemp movement after, I guess I'll say retirement, but you will uh, correct me if I'm wrong, from an executive position at Dell Computer um, with a tremendous love of cars and, of course, a very strong interest. Uh, in ecology and the environment. Can you tell us a little bit about that transition from Dell uh, into really one of the more complex applications and aspects of what we can do with this versatile, valuable fiber, hemp? Well, uh, the experience at Dell was so long ago, it seems like a previous life, Joy. Uh, I, left, uh, I left the computer industry in 1996 and uh, Eventually, I did a couple more things and then for a couple of years after that and then moved down to Key West just to decompress from it all. It was very uh, high stress, high, high, you know, uh, high powered kind of uh, <laughs> world to live in, in the computer and Internet um, world. And so when I went down to Key West, I relaxed for a few years and then I got the bug that I wanted to design my own car. And did that, and that's when I uh, read The Emperor Wears No Clothes by Jack Herer, and there's a section in there that talks about Henry Ford's car, and that's what inspired me, because Henry Ford actually built what is still probably the greenest car that was ever created. And, and as a matter of fact, we'll just take one second here, brother, to just for our listeners, um, to just understand here, we're talking around 1941. December of 1941 is when Popular Mechanics magazine publishes, of course, the, the car that Henry Ford, quote, grew from the soil. Uh, and, and it was a, a fantastic article because what were we doing in 41, right? We were moving into World War II. And the article was called Pinch Hitters for Defense and really saying, listen, we need all these newfangled petroleum-based synthetic polymer plastics and nylons for the war effort. And we need these metals for the war effort. So these were pinch hitters for defense, like Ford, who were creating, and they didn't use the term at the time, really these uh, renewable uh, biocomposite materials for for stateside or, or homeland uh, goods, including cars, while these other newfangled materials and metals went off for the war. So, so you you learn about Henry uh, Ford's car through Jack's book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, and, and take it back from there, sir. Yeah, it was really an interesting uh, article that was in, in Jack's book. And, of course, that just led me to do more research and uh, more study about uh, what Henry Ford had done. Interesting story about him. Uh, he, of course, was uh, best buddies with Harvey Firestone and Thomas Edison. And another guy, there were four guys that used to run around the country uh, together in a caravan of Ford Model Ts, along with all of their servants, of course, um, and camping out and uh, being, eating fantastic meals every night in, in tents. Uh, they called themselves the Vagabond. But the fourth guy was a guy named John Burroughs, and he was, John was one of the uh, most famous authors uh, during that time frame in the early 1900s, and he wrote about nature. And he sent a, a nasty gram to Henry Ford saying that your your uh, facility is the most polluting facility in the world. You're a bad guy. And Henry Ford responded to him by sending him a, a Ford Model T and said, uh, here, drive this thing around, get out into the country so you can really see the country. And he thought that was kind of fun. And so they, they joined forces and, and they wandered around in this caravan of, of, of Ford cars. And they would always stop at these old mills that used to process grain, and they were all run by water wheels, right? So um, what do you call that? Hydro, hydroelectricity, that whole five horsepower per mill. And that's when he got the idea of, of uh, manufacturing, or around that time, uh, manufacturing everything possible from plant materials and using hydroelectricity to do it. So 
way back in 1914, these four guys, including Henry Ford and John Burroughs and uh, Thomas Edison, had invented basically the concept of carbon negative manufacturing. And so now here we are, all these years later, coming back to that, and people are starting to understand, you know, the, the idea of making everything from plant material and using renewable energy. And so uh, these guys were teaching us a lesson a hundred, a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago. Man, a major foreshadowing. And as I often like to say, everything old is new again, new and, and better with, with more technology. I mean, we couldn't even see things on the nanoscale, brother, when I first got into hemp in 1990. Now we can. Uh, let's talk for a minute. There, you are just such a treasure. I feel like I, I already need a part two with you um, because you just, your perspective is, is really so valuable and so far reaching. But let's start with, and, and I often ask this question to folks, you know, why hemp, whether it's a, a panel that I'm moderating or, or an interview and, and folks give me all of the environmental reasons and, and we can talk about those. And those are obviously incredibly important. Um, but what I really want to go for is the performance reason. I mean, for heaven's sake, what would hemp be if, okay, it's better for the environment, but it lacks performance and it gives you an inferior product. The opposite is true with hemp. We are talking about whether it's paper, whether it's the food supply, uh, whether it's textiles, whether it's car parts. Uh, we're talking about actually improving the performance of the material by incorporating hemp fiber into it. Could, so could you give the listeners um, some reasons of why hemp in a car, performance-wise? Sure, sure. Um, well, let me give you the, the, the top-level view, and then I'll go right into cars. But the top-level view, why hemp, is because it has the potential to be the number one carbon avoidance and carbon reduction technology of our time. It has the it has the potential to address the climate crisis better, in my opinion, than anything else out there right now. And one of the things that I do is, and I've been doing this since 2013, is focus on how to quantify that, and so that uh, governments and uh, different agencies around the world are able to look at that data and say, yes, this is not smoke and mirrors. This isn't just a bunch of hamsters that are, you know, having crazy ideas and posting exaggerations, et cetera, on the web. Uh, it's actually quantifiable. And uh, uh, I spent a few hours on, on conference calls uh, this, this morning as well, uh, talking to uh, National Hemp Association, et cetera. And we're building a bit of a consortium around this so that we can build some metrics that everyone can be able to adopt, and we can go to the Biden administration, we can go to the French administration, we can go to whatever country, et cetera, and use the same kind of numbers um, and have everybody basically have a consensus that these numbers make sense. Now, uh, now this all came about as a process of experimenting with hemp fibers to make a, a car body, right? And so when Henry Ford did his, and, and, it, and he started in 1929, um, he used just a, a random random fibers from hemp, sisal, uh, wheat straw, and, and several other things. And he held it all together with, with a resin, uh, which was not, we don't know for sure, but it was probably a soybean resin. But this was a this was a, a you know loose loose fibers right they weren't woven together etc. And when you use loose fibers, um, it's good, it's great, but you have to use a little bit more of them, which means you have to use a little bit more resin too, which means it's going to be a little thicker and it's going to be a little heavier. So when I saw what Henry Ford did back in the in the 1930s in in, in building that car, uh, immediately recognized that in the 1950s fiberglass was starting to be woven. It was no longer just available in a loose format. And once you start to weave these types of materials, that's fiberglass, of course, is a synthetic material. So is carbon fiber. And, and they've been used in cars for a long time. So I set out to make the reinforcing fiber inside my body panels out of 100% hemp. 
Okay, Henry Ford's car was only about seven percent half. The, all of the reinforcement fiber in my car, one hundred percent of it, is hemp. So if he had a hemp car, I had a I had a hemp car <laughs> times ten, uh, and it was stronger and lighter. And it's simply because I adopted what had already been learned by so many other companies in the fifties, sixties, etc. Which was to weave the fibers. Yeah, and and Henry Ford probably could have figured it out there too, but you know, he, apparently he didn't. Um, but what I found is that the performance uh, in using about the same amount of, mater- of material as woven fiberglass, it actually can get the job done with a little bit less hemp. Hemp worked just a little bit better. Um, in order to get it just as stiff as, say, carbon fiber, had to use a little bit more. But carbon fiber costs about five times more. So if you got to pe- spend, you know, an extra uh, 20%, in order to do it in hemp, it's still a whole lot cheaper to do it in hemp. So I suspect we're going to see a lot of companies in the future um, make hemp body automobiles. Um, there are certain things that still have to be figured out, uh, but uh, it's I think it's going to be inevitable. And, and on top of that, um, just in studying the steel market, which I'd love to talk about a little bit, and the cement market, et cetera, and construction. Um, it turns out that uh, you know steel. In order to make brand new steel, what they call virgin steel, you have to use fossil fuels. You have to heat iron ore up to three thousand degrees, and uh, it, so you need fossil fuels pretty much to do that. And um, the one the one uh, market subsector of the of the steel market that uses the most uh, virgin steel is the automobile industry. <laughs> yes, and, and let's for a moment, too, let's talk, again, when we're talking about performance, and, we, and we've, and I, lo- I, I got in this for the, I mean, I've been an M for 30 years because of the environment, absolutely. But when we talk about the performance of the material itself, and why is it that Mercedes and BMW and any number of other car manufacturers, including Toyota right here stateside in Kentucky, but but BMW and, and Mercedes, you know, started to incorporate, and it's been a number of years now, uh, a hemp and canaf liner, you know, door liner, the BMW 3 and 5 series in Germany. Um, why is that? It's has reduced the weight of the car overall. And of course, the European uh, Union, as you well know, are under much stricter uh, requirements than we are. And I hope we catch up soon in terms of reducing and goals for reducing carbon emissions. So it reduces the overall weight of the car. And I think just for that initial, and it's probably gotten a little lighter and a little thinner, as as you said, as technology has improved, but I think it's been around 2014-ish or so that the that the BMW 3 and 5 uh, series in Germany were incorporated with that hemp and canaf door liner. It reduced, my understanding, is the overall weight of the car by 5 kilograms, which had a quantifiable effect on a reduction of CO2. And so we're not just talking about lighter, but also stronger. And, and you know, that is is what I mean by not having the nanotech, the ability to see things on a nanoscale until more recently in history where we have come to discover that on the nanoscale, uh, you know, hemp, hemp cellulose is, is basically second only in surface area and strength to carbon nanotubes and graphite whiskers, which are man-made materials. Do you want to talk to us about man-made materials not only being cost prohibitive for R&D and bad for the planet, but, but how we can replace them with plant-based materials? I've been misquoted many times uh, on videos like uh, Jay Leno's Garage, et cetera, where they actually put in, it says that uh, hemp is 10 times stronger than steel. Uh, there is no, when it comes to engineering, they don't use the word strong, right? They say, what's the tensile strength or what's the compressive strength, et cetera? What's the modulus and all this? And they've got the fancy words. For yes, it. it's the tensile strength, exactly. The, 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 the bottom line is that all these different materials out there have different characters. And hemp is perhaps the strongest natural fiber out there. There are, of course, uh, synthetic materials that have a higher, much higher tensile and compressive strength. But <clears throat> here's here's what the what the bottom line is. Um, this 
planet cannot continue to exist if the only decisions that we make uh, about about how we uh, how we manufacture things are what's the cheapest and what's going to be the very lightest and stiffest, right? Because if we could, if if I mean, there are plenty of engineers out here out there right now that would probably, if they had the opportunity, they could get a hold of carbon fiber as cheap as fiberglass as hemp or, or hemp. They would probably put carbon fiber into everything. But that's because it, it it does a great job. It's super light. It's very stiff. Unfortunately, it's extremely brittle. If you hit it, it'll almost explode, uh, which is kind of a downside. But um, they, that's because they, we've been on this kick about light waiting for so long, right? And that's been the answer that's coming from the automo- automotive uh, industry and the, and the aerospace industry. Make everything as light as possible and you get better gas mileage gas mileage, right? Well, that that just doesn't make sense. First off, we shouldn't be burning gas anyway. Um, but <laughs> we, we need to, if, if you have to use a little bit more of a natural fiber in order to get the job done, just a little bit more, then that's what you should be doing because we can't continue to make these materials um, that require massive amounts of fossil fuels. That's the key. Right now, um, there are there are materials like carbon fiber, fiberglass, steel, and aluminum, uh, and even cement, if you want to count that as well. All of those are, are structural type of materials. All of them require massive amounts of fossil fuels in order to produce. You cannot produce cement without massive amounts of fossil fuels. For every every ton of cement that you produce, you're, you're going to end up dumping a ton into the atmosphere. And at the other end of the continuum, for every ton of carbon fiber that you produce, right? This super lightweight, space age material, groovy stuff, you're gonna dump 20 tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. One to 20 ratio. That's how much fossil fuels are required. So these materials are on, are potentially on their last legs, right? A lot of these materials, because we're phasing out fossil fuels, Joy, in the coming decades and hopefully within the next nine years, because at the end of the next nine years, climate crisis could be a runaway train and could get get away from us, and there may be no way to turn it turn it around, according to what the IPCC is saying. So, literally, we have to stop burning fossil fuels right now, right right now, and that means no more no more steel, no more aluminum, no more fiberglass, no no more carbon fiber, no more cement. That's right. So, what what are we going to turn to? We got to turn to what Henry Ford suggested. You know, um, grow cars from the soil. If he would have had a little catchier phrase, I think he would have said, "Make everything possible from hemp," and and we can make a lot of stuff from hemp. I think we could probably make at least half the stuff that's made today. No doubt about it. And I did want you to feel better about. First of all, I'm I'm misquoted all the time, and I occasionally misspeak. But I want you to know that the that the hemp is ten times stronger than steel. Quote: They got that directly out of that Popular Mechanics article from December of 1941. Yes, they were quoting it directly from the article itself. Um, I want to ask you so that we don't miss the most important question of of this uh potentially it, it is the most important question to some folks that are listening out there and that is can someone order a renew hemp sports car from you and and what is the price range well <clears throat> i only i i only build these cars if somebody you know, commits and sends a lot of money up front right um it's not my passion per se my passion is saving the planet uh, by developing the materials so others can make their products out of hemp. So that's my real focus right now. If somebody really wanted to buy a car, um, since they're hand built, they're really expensive to build that way. Um, it's not mass produced in any stretch of the imagination. So we don't have the tooling to stamp out fenders, you know. One every thirty seconds, like Ford Motor, Motor Company or, or General Motors. Or something. So the the price would start at about a hundred thousand dollars. So you'd really have to be kind of a, a hemp enthusiast, or you want to be a collector, and you hope that maybe someday it'll be worth a lot of money. Um, but uh, 
So yeah, you could reach out and, you know, if you want to pay that kind of money, I, 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 I might make one. But what my real focus right now is, is carbon negative. And carbon negative fiber. Please tell us about those uh, projects as well. What you're, what you're, endeavoring right now uh, obviously in addition to your uh, really important educational and advocacy work which i know is a is a primary love for both of us but tell us what uh projects carbon negative fiber is working on right now sure so over the last uh, seven years i've experimented with probably a couple dozen different woven hemp fibers and a couple of different types of resins the liquid material that holds it all together when you know you put in a uh, activator and it makes it solid makes it a solid uh, body part um and found what worked what worked okay and eventually figured out what could work out even better so right now we're, we're just about to do a run of a brand new type of fabric that's designed specifically not 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 for regular textiles for clothing right uh, which i know you have a you have an entire wardrobe of that. I, when every every time I see you, you got something new, new, new hemp stuff. But this would be for uh, structural and semi-structural applications, which would include car bodies. It would also include car chassis. It would also include, uh, say, hollow-bodied guitars. Uh, I was talking to talking to uh, uh, Morris uh, at the show about that. He's got this beautiful. Uh, I'm sure you saw it as solid, solid body guitar, but it would also be, uh, this would also be used for a hollow body type of guitars, and violins, et cetera. Uh, and also uh, sporting goods. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but when you use a natural fiber to make a, a sporting good instead of fiberglass or carbon fiber, you actually get better performance. You get just a little bit of a twist in a surfboard and when you're skiing with a with a ski that's made with natural fiber, um, you get you're, you're getting a little bit uh, better uh, action on your sporting good um, because what you have with a, a natural fiber like this is it, it, it's well it's it's called energy damping, right? So um, mm. when you see when you see the video of me myself and Jay Leno beating beating the crap out of my car right that's because it it and it, it absorbs energy right it it doesn't it's not so brittle etc you know, like carbon fiber is so right away almost all i think almost all um sporting goods are going to be uh, acceptance of carbon negative fiber um it's it's just it just performs so much better than these synthetic materials. And, you know, one of the reasons people like to buy stuff that's made from carbon fiber is because it's got a clear coat on it. And you can tell your friends, hey, I've got skis made out of carbon fiber. Aren't I cool? It's so cool. It is just so cool. And I got the word torque. You know, we use that word a bit uh, in the hempcrete world. And by the way, I love that the truth windows, we call them in the hempcrete world, where you maybe are doing an interior sort of uh, rendering with lime, but but like your clear epoxy, you leave a little section free so that you can see the beautiful hempcrete underneath. Oh my gosh, I love it. Exactly. <clears throat> now, when you saw the car, yes. right? And we got pictures of, of uh, you in front yeah. of the car at NOCO. You remember that little the the little piece down down in the front that's called an air dam or an air splitter? I sure do. We got to see the fibers. Right. So that yeah, what you saw there was a clear coat over the actual hemp fibers, and as you could see, it almost looked like marble. It just was a beautiful beautiful look. And so in the future. You're going to see people on ski slopes and playing tennis and riding scooters with these with this uh, carbon negative fiber material, and it'll it'll probably be clear coated in many applications just so people will have that that bragging rights going like, well, how come your how come your tennis racket isn't made out of carbon fiber because it's made out of something better, something something that's good for the planet. It's called carbon negative fiber, and it doesn't dump CO2 into the atmosphere. Instead, it takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. It avoids dumping 
and it also it also reduces CO2. So it's a technology I call carbon avoidance and reduction technology. Love it. Carbon avoidance and reduction technology. And you're, you're also reminding me of the same folks that I believe who originally were making the, those BMW 3 and 5 uh, series door liners, the Hemp and Knaft door liners I, I spoke with you about out of Germany. I believe also were the same folks that were making and still make probably those uh, Hemp and Knaft briefcases or little mini suitcases that, you know, some of us hempsters have and love to carry them around because they too are showing the actual fiber itself. There's nothing cosmetic over that. You are looking at the actual uh, fibers. And and it's also attractive. I mean, that's the thing. There's so many different revolutions happening at once now as we just sort of um, hyper catapult into our future and taking responsibility for being stewards of this planet and of the human race and frankly, all the animals and winged and swimming creatures as well. Um, but there's the revolution of consciousness. There's an agricultural, regenerative agricultural revolution. We've got uh, a revolution of equality here and diversity and, in, and inclusion. Um, and also, and, and there are many others that I'm skipping that are so, so important, but I'm, I'm kind of skipping right to, you know, also a revolution of aesthetics, for heaven's sake, where our, the vibration of who we are and what is important to the planet and for harmony and health on the planet is starting to match what we like, what we like to have, what we like to see, what we like to touch, what we like to feel. It is, it's, it's a revolutionary of aesthetics as well. And so I am so thrilled to see that gorgeous marbling um, of the carbon negative fiber. And we're, we're seeing more of it. And man, is it going to be, you know, on, on store shelves everywhere before we know it. And yet, of course, the infrastructure is coming. And that's sort of, we, we talk a lot on this show about, uh, you know, asking the farmers to grow a crop for which there's very little infrastructure, unless of course you're talking about extracting for cannabinoids since we have, you know, ad nauseum saturated infrastructure for that. But we're asking the farmer to grow a crop for which there's little fiber and grain processing infrastructure and manufacturing infrastructure. And, and we're asking entrepreneurs um, and businesses of all sizes to invest in infrastructure for types of a crop, grain and fiber, that are, you know, just starting to come online. And we want people to big build, build big facilities, which would mean they would need to have the, the raw material, the, the crops, to feed for those feedstocks to feed the processing and manufacturing machine. But we are doing it. We are one step in front of the other working in tandem. It is starting to happen. Um, and, and we love to see that, but that infrastructure is what we need to see, Bruce, as you well know, we'd like to see the processing and manufacturing within ideally 50 to hundred square miles of every, of every feedstock and, uh, anything that you want to add about the, the infrastructure and, and, and challenges or, or sunshine on the horizon um, along those lines. Well, yeah, Joy, I, I would. Um, I think we're in a unique situation, and um, it's 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 been building ever since Jack Herrer wrote his book, and so it's, I think we're in a unique time right now, uh, whereby even the even even the administration say that our current president. President Biden is interested in um, addressing the climate crisis situation, and I, I believe again. I said this before that I believe that nothing has the potential to save the planet as much as hemp. And I, I know that sounds kind of hippy dippy, weatherman and everything, but when you actually sit down and you do the calculations and you see how much hemp we would have to grow and how much we would use it how much CO2 could be avoided by not using a lot of materials that we're currently using, and then how much CO2 can be sequestered by making those things out of hemp instead, the numbers are mind-boggling. Just give you an example here, because it, 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 from a financial standpoint, because the financial people have to, have to buy into this, right? But the, the, the entire amount of steel and concrete or cement that are being produced right now. I say concrete, it's not, not sand. 
cement, and steel around the world. It's a total of $1.6 trillion, right? And they're two of the most destructive things that are going on, steel and cement. And I have postulated that a large percentage of that $1.6 trillion could be supplanted by him. We don't have the research yet, but we're working on it to try to figure out how much of that realistically could be supplanted using hemp. Um, you're not, can't, hemp cannot replace everything. You can't make a foundation with hemp. You can't make sidewalks out of hemp. But you, you can make buildings up to 18 stories tall. I'm pretty confident of that. And we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully prove that in short order. And those buildings would be very similar to um, wooden beam buildings, right? Only you'd be using hemp, which is better better for the planet, right? Let the trees stay on the ground. Um, and then the walls of these buildings wouldn't necessarily have to be concrete or drywall, et cetera. They could be nice 12 inch thick hempcrete. And <clears throat> that building as such, if it's 18, 18 stories tall or shorter, right, is going to weigh about one fourteenth of a regular concrete building. Steel and steel wouldn't be quite that much of a difference, but uh, that's where we can apply the hemp into the construction industry. That's where I think it can make the biggest impact, and we can literally. Just within that one, you know, one stroke of a pen from, you know, some of the major countries, governments around the world saying, this is the way we're going to avoid CO2, carbon avoidance, and, and reduce CO2, carbon reduction. Yes, because as you well know, the hempcrete wall becomes a carbon sink. And that isn't even just because that's not because of the hemp as much as it is the lime, which of course seeks to become calcium carbonate again and wants to become a stone. So we, we use it as mortar with our hempcrete. We use it as a binder with hempcrete. Um, and then it wants to grab the carbon molecules from the air to become stone again. It is just uh, it, just a, a fantastic cycle, the lime cycle, and how all of that, uh, a, a, in addition to the fact, as you know, Portland cement needs to be heated to 3,000 degrees, whereas the type of lime that we use as a binder for hempcrete, only 900. Now, still, we have to take responsibility and account for the carbon footprint for heating that limestone to 900 degrees, but it's not 3,000 degrees, you know? And I think the other thing, you know, and I, I wanted to also mention, too, that while it's true, can't make roads, can't make uh, sidewalks, the reality is that there is some aggregate, hemp aggregate, being used for in with the Portland cement. And and as I've heard you say in, in other interviews um, and other talks, uh, you know, hemp can be, if we're talking about plastic, it can be made to be recyclable, not recyclable, biodegradable, not biodegradable, not that we're so into the repeating the biodegradable stuff so which is still all over the oceans um but it, it's still less poisonous and less toxic if you've removed some of the toxic stuff and replaced it with hemp and the same is true for portland cement for be using that for roads and and foundations and sidewalks mm -hmm. that's right that's right you know I'm, I'm glad you brought up bio bio uh degradability because that's another thing that is misunderstood i think in the hemp industry you see a lot of folks posting that hemp is wonderful because it's biodegradable. And I've had people make that comment. I love the hemp car because it's biodegradable. Believe me, my car is not biodegradable. <laughs> and neither would I want it to be. And here's why. Um, when anything biodegrades, any kind of plant material biodegrades, what happens to that CO2? It goes right back into the atmosphere, right? So what we want to do with hemp um, is use it to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis. And once we've done that, we want to make durable or recyclable goods out of it. And our problem has not been that uh, 
that plastic bottles are not biocompostable. Our problem is we're living like a bunch of pigs on this planet, and we throw stuff into the ocean instead of sending it all back to the recycling center where it should be going. So that that was the original plan when companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi all came out and said, wow, let's take, make these bottles out of PET. They'll last forever, et cetera, and we'll make sure we recycle them. <laughs> but then they kind of forgot to, to, to you know, give everybody a nickel to make sure it got recycled. So now they're getting back into that concept. But bottom line, you really don't want hemp to be, re- to be bio, bio, uh, biodegradable. Uh, and even try and get it to be biodegradable. There are there are ways to make it biodegradable, et cetera, but then you have to ship it off to a certain type of biodegrading uh, facility, and there's only 40 of them around the world. Uh, that's not the way to go. The way to go is to permanently sequester that CO2. So if, if a thousand years from now, they decide my car is ugly and they take it out of the museum and they want to get rid of it, I'm going to, you know, if I'm still around, <laughs> I'm going to say, go ahead and grind it up and turn it into asphalt because that keeps it sequestered. You don't want that CO2 going back in the atmosphere. You don't want to burn it. You don't want it to bio, biodegrade. But that's just another pet peeve. Um, but but getting back to the this, this, the, con- the construction, um, I, I'm a big fan of Hemp Plastics Company. Uh, Glenn's a good friend. Um, but the big, big opportunity, just the monstrous mammoth opportunity is is replacing as much cement and steel as possible and it's not replacing it with materials like fiberglass and carbon fiber and aluminum because those produce even more uh, co2 when you to manufacture so you got to replace them with 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 hemp 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 types of uh, material and the, the 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 potential there joy is measured in gigatons. Um, if we were, if it were possible to replace 50% of those materials, and we don't know if that's possible, but done the calculations, it could be up to eight, eight gigatons different CO2 in the atmosphere. Now that's a wild number. That's bigger than anything that's ever been proposed, even by the book Drawdown, et cetera, by another 40%. Um, but if we, if we, if we, made a concerted effort to make every building out of hemp, both the structure and the hempcrete, it would be the biggest thing that could ever happen. And there would be huge side effects as well. Because as you know, you can grow the plant, not just for fiber, but also for seed. So if we're growing, say, 9% of the deforested uh, lands around the world right now, uh, growing hemp and cultivating it, instead of planting trees that grow only 25% as fast, right? Um, If we did that, we would have enough material to replace 50% of of steel and cement. Whether or not that's um, viable um, in terms of application, I don't know just yet. We're still studying it. But the, the side effect is that you would also have all the seed that you would get for free, for free. So what are the what are the two things that the poorest countries in the world need right now? Housing and food, right? And so we would be able to feed the, we would be able to address world hunger by doing so. And we'd also be able to reduce the amount of energy by 80% to heat these homes. And we would also be able to eat cheeseburgers made out of hemp seed instead of instead of a cow <laughs> we could basically with that amount of with that amount of growth right we would have so much seed we could we could stop we could stop raising cows and that would be and every one of those measures is is it gives us the benefit of of, of additional gig, gigatons per year yes i do i do just want to make sure that the that the you know l- listeners so we give uh, the most accurate information we can and we've all got our our strengths and all of those things that you know uh generally for fiber varieties we don't see a lot of seeds because we 
a lot of male male plants. So, you know, hemp can be all female, all male, hermaphrodite. We we are quite a, f- a fascinating plant, the cannabis plant. <laughs> so fascinating. Yes, we accept we accept all of the above. We are very uh... We've got it's, we've got it's, we've got they's, we've got he's, we've got she's, we love it all. Um so so it's true and and you know, we often see fiber types of 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 hemp are grown very close together, sometimes three to 400 plants in a square meter, uh, you know, versus uh, grain, which is generally planted eh, 100 to 200 plants per square meter. And then, of course, there's your American style extract hemp growing, <laughs> which is practically horticultural and about one plant per one and a half square meter. So it, it's, an, it's so interesting. But yeah, it, it's the gift that keeps on giving. It's the value add, the value add, the value add. Every time you turn around, if you're doing things correctly, and I guess by that we mean employing regenerative agricultural practices, um, uh, we really see that there are no byproducts with hemp. There are co-products with hemp. And and if we are using, mimicking d- designs in nature, uh, we see that we can maximize this potential and, and exponentially utilize this plant to, to heal our soil, to build the soil, to create jobs, stimulate the economy, create and produce better, more uh, superior performing uh, products. I mean, it is, and we're all just getting started together. And you know where that leads me, Bruce, is of all the tremendous work that you do, of course, and as and as the listeners know here, and we just recently had Dan Hare on the show, which was my favorite interview so far in the history of interviews here, um, is the emperor wears no, oh, he's so wonderful is the emperor wears no clothes, which, you know, again, is the, I, 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 it's so hard. I get torn using words like Bible, but there's really, that's the most descriptive way to say it. It is the Bible of the hemp and cannabis movements, you know, originally published in 1985 in a newspaper form, then finally its first edition in a book form in 1988. It has had several editions since, and you and Dan really did a lot of work with the newest and latest and greatest edition of The Emperor Wears No Clothes, which from Kindle is just value added with live links that send the reader on a massive educational adventure into the wide, wide world of hemp. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it was probably um, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years ago, Dan called me up uh, knowing that I came out of the computer industry. He probably, I guess he figured that I knew how to work a computer and uh he asked me if i if i could help get the uh book republished because it's been out of print since jack passed away um, for about 10 years and so he wanted to get the book back out there and uh so one of the ideas i had was to do an ebook version as well as a paperback and in the ebook you know i checked with dan to make sure it was a groovy idea and uh said you know We've only we've we we can we can put in um, all of your dad's writing in black ink, and then all these hyperlinks are all blue ink with an underline. In them. So we'll make it real clear at the beginning that we haven't altered any of Jack's original work. All we've done is updated the uh, the reader with what's happened, you know, in the last ten years. And as you know. A lot's happened in the last 10 years. <laughs> so it was it was great because you're reading the ebook and you'll you know go, wow, that's interesting. I you know, I wonder what's what has happened with uh, you know C B or what's you know, there wasn't much much news about C B D back then, right? But uh, and there were probably just a couple of dozen um, treatments, you know, medical treatments that were fairly well understood and and discussed in Jack's book. And now there's literally hundreds, right? So chapter seven is is so much bigger than the original chapter seven. I mean, you name an ailment and there's some sort of story or even a video and even better yet, a personal testimony from somebody that said, cannabis saved my life. And there's dozens and dozens of those in the book. 
Um, so, and the other thing it's, I mean, it's kind of a primer. I, I would, you know, I, I'm a little biased here, but I, I just think if you're going to be in the, in the cannabis space, any part of the cannabis space, you need to know the history. And this is the book to, to know the history. If you want to have something on your coffee table to spark conversations, buy the paperback for 35 bucks. If you want to get the, the biggest bang for the buck, buy the ebook because it's got all sorts of new information and videos, links to videos and stories. And that's only nine nine ninety nine. So um, that was a lot of fun to bring that out. And uh, it's it's doing pretty well. It's pretty popular. Oh, it, it was such, such important work um, to this day, as important as it ever was. Uh, know your history to know your destiny and to really understand for any skeptics out there who may uh, be listening to the show. You know, why why are we hearing about all this hemp stuff now? Well, that is exactly what The Emperor Wears No Clothes is about. It's, it's telling us that not only did the U.S. government, which really was the global bullies of of, of cannabis prohibition, uh, they didn't just want to take the plant out of our out of our consciousness. They wanted to take all knowledge of the plant out of our consciousness. Otherwise, it would be in all of the Encyclopedia Britannica when we were growing up. the The state museums, the national museums, um, the dictionary, all of those things. It was very carefully and with precision yeah. excised from our field of awareness. And this is why the emperor wears no clothes is so so very important. Bruce, as we come to a close here, brother, is there a question that you wish I'd asked or or anything that you want to make sure you leave the listeners with before we go? Uh, yeah, Joy. Um, thanks for asking. Here on your site, I, I, I understand that you're going to be posting links to uh, to where they can, where people can find more information. Um, one of those links is to the sports car, right? The Renew sports car. And if you like to watch lots of video, you want to see Jay Leno beat the crap out of the car. Uh, if you want to see, I think about 400 articles have been written about this. Wow. It's just gotten a lot of attention and, and it's, I think it's helped to raise awareness of him. Um, so that's renewsportscars.com. The, uh, the other one, the new venture is uh, carbonnegativefiber.com. And there you can follow what we're doing to make replacements for structural and semi-structural materials out of hemp that will enable a lot more products and especially buildings to be made from, from hemp. And then the third one, there's a very specific link that Dan has put onto the website here from what I understand he's going to do. And that's a direct link to Amazon where they where people can buy the real deal emperor wears no clothes 14 edition edition uh paperback and the second edition ebook so make sure you get those because the proceeds from those sales go to the uh Herer foundation um, and it's also the least expensive way to buy the book too <laughs> you could buy some really old books and spend a lot of money but this is the way to get the latest and greatest at the best price so, so important, folks. And go to podconnects.com. That's P O D C O N X, podconnects.com to get all of these links. Bruce, can't wait to have you back on again. I can't wait to see you at our next event, which may very well end up being Southern Hemp Expo in Raleigh, North Carolina in September. Am I going to see you there, brother? I think you will, my friend. I, I bet I will. Thank you for everything that you do, Bruce, everything that you are. Thanks for being on the show today. Can't wait till our next encounter, brother. Thank you, Joy. I appreciate being on your show. <laughs>